California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another episode of California True Crime. I'm Sean again tonight. With me is Charles and Jessica. How are you? Good. I'm excellent. Great. Thank you. So this is the story of Carrie Stainer. This is the second part. A little recap of what we talked about in the last episode is we discussed Carrie's growing up, his childhood, his adult life. We spoke of the murders of Carol and Julie Sund and Sylvina Peloso. And we also talked about afterwards where they feel like they caught some people um, from Modesto and they, the FBI has them. They did a grand jury. They are now in custody and everyone believes they have the right people for this. So now we must jump ahead and date to July of 1999 and get to the story of Joey Armstrong. So with it being July, I think we left off in April with them having the grand jury, so it's a couple months later. Joey lived in Forestville and Santa Rosa as a child. She graduated from high school in Florida, then attended Chico State, where she studied environmental science, natural resource management, and art. She worked as a nature bridge educator in Yosemite at the time, which is a nonprofit teaching kids about nature and wildlife in Yosemite. Before she worked here, she worked at an Autobahn Center on the San Francisco Bay. I had to look up what an Autobahn Center was. And from the National Autobahn Society, it says, Autobahn protects birds and the places they need today and tomorrow. She was also a camp counselor for school kids in Sonora, California. Sonora is, it's in around the same area that uh, the car was kind of found. It's a little bit south of where Miwok Village and Long Barn is. It's it's just another one of these gold rush style towns. We have a friend, Brad, who during his senior year in 1997 was a camp counselor at Foothill Horizons for sixth grade camp in Sonora. That year at camp, Brad had the pleasure of working with Joey. He said how great she was with the kids and was great teaching them about nature Another thing was when they weren't around the kids, how much of a down-to-earth person she was and just all-around great human. So when we were looking up things about Joey Armstrong, what I found is that she really had a love of nature and that it uh, started way back when she lived in Florida. There was a story in the Orlando Sentinel where her friends would work at a coffee shop and she would visit them every day and she would come just to take care of all the plants in the coffee shop. She didn't work there, she didn't get paid, but she was very concerned about keeping those plants alive. And one of her friends, Kim Fox, in the Orlando Seno, said, quote, she was just amazing. She was so spirited. She was so magnetic and so fun. People have referred to her as a bright star, a bright spark in their lives. I think that just kind of sums up. Everybody we meet or talk to who knew her seemed to say the same thing. With Joey's current job at Yosemite, she lives in a house with a roommate and her fiancé, which is about 30 minutes away from the actual touristy area, but still very secluded in an area called Foresta. The house that she lives in is referred to as, quote, the greenhouse in the meadow. On July 20th, 1999, Joey stayed the night alone in the cabin since her roommate was gone and her fiancé was taking kids on a wilderness hike. On July 21st, the next day, Joey planned on going and staying with a friend in Sausalito, which is in the Bay Area, since she wasn't too keen on staying uh, in the cabin alone for multiple nights and was to leave early in the morning on July 21st. So the day in question, Carrie was in Yosemite sunbathing and wanted to go check out the barn where he'd first seen Bigfoot. I think uh, Charles brought this up when he was talking about Bigfoot in the other episode that 
this barn is directly right next to the house. So he's been there before and he just, he wanted to go reminisce about his Bigfoot sighting. While there, he sees Joey moving things to her vehicle to go on her trip to Sausalito. When she's watering her plants in front of the house, Carrie steps up to make conversation with her. He tells her he likes how her house is and also tells her the story about Bigfoot. He asks if she has ever seen Bigfoot, and she says no, but maybe her roommates have. Carrie asked if the roommates are home, where she answered no. Carrie had a gun on him, which we talked about his planning in the past because he always had that bag on him it was it was still with him and uh while he was talking to her and while she was occupied moving things and watering her plants he would move a little closer to her he eventually pulled out the gun and makes her enter the house where he binds her legs she was fighting the whole time and ripped the bindings which was just tape and carrie had to do it again carrie then got her into the back of his scout and put a sleeping bag over her. She fought the whole time, and finally she was able to jump headfirst out of the window. Um, I also read that the car car had only traveled about 300 feet, so the car wasn't really moving too much when she had jumped out. Carrie was able to get out, catch her, and at this point he slit her throat. Uh, This was out in the open where other neighbors could maybe see Carrie. So he took Joey to a more secluded wooded area, and he ended up decapitating Joey. Now, word traveled fast about Joey missing since her friend called the police when Joey didn't arrive. The search for her happened very quickly, and Joey's body was found within a couple of hours, but they didn't find her head right away. During the investigation, before they found Joey's body, they were already finding things that seemed like it was more than just a missing person's. They found a pair of smashed sunglasses on the front porch. They also found tire tracks and two sets of footprints forming into one uh, that had heavier indentations, giving the assumption that someone was then carried by someone else. And with these tire tracks, they found two different witnesses placing an international scout with distinct colors in the area. We will put a picture of the International Scout on our website. The police first picked up Carrie for questioning and asked to search his vehicle, which he agreed, but when it came to the backpack, he said no. So at this time when they found Carrie, they had found her body, but they hadn't found Joey's head yet. So the police were actually thinking that Joey's head might be in the backpack, and they didn't want to take any chances, so they waited for a search warrant. And when they got it and they opened it, they didn't find things that seemed very important at all. The head wasn't in there. Um, From Reinick's book, there was something about the top of a snack bag that will match up to evidence found at the scene later. But at the time, it wasn't important. Where do they pick Carrie up at? Um, After they put out a bolo, they actually found the scout parked on Highway 140. And when they found who had the truck, it was Carrie and he was sunbathing naked and smoking a joint down by a little spot so they waited till he put his clothes on and came back up to the truck and this is the second time he's being interviewed by the police yeah the first time was after um as like the maintenance man of the cedar lodge that well i mean if you could go back to third if we talk about uncle jesse but (laughs) right right for right now he does seem to get questioned a lot by police So after all this, they still let him go since they didn't really have enough to hold him, but they said they might be back to question him soon. Uh, Immediately, he went back to El Portal, sold some things to people that he knew, and went and checked into a hotel somewhere else. He paid for two days at the hotel, but then checked out out of that hotel a day early. He went to a nudist colony, and I guess by this point, the news had picked up that they were still looking for him to question again. And they put out like a thing on the news with his picture and stuff. A customer at the restaurant of the nudist colony had seen the news and called the police to inform them that he was there. Now, at this point, uh, FBI agent Jeffrey Reinick received a call from his office to go pick up Carrie at Laguna del Sol to bring him back for questioning. When they arrived, Carrie saw them and he just kind of stood up and put his hands behind his head and went peacefully into the car. He was eating in the restaurant and he was not naked. 
the long drive back, Reinick and Carrie talked about things such as Steven and movies, and he seemed to establish a rapport with him. When they got back to the headquarters that they were going to ask him questions, with Reinick just pretty much being a nice guy to him, Carrie opened up and confessed. So what would be the date that Reinick picks him up from the nudist colony? It's actually the 24th. So this is three days after the murder. And uh, Reinick got a call and he had to go to Wilton, California, which isn't that far from Sacramento, like the FBI office in Sacramento. But the nudist colony that he had to go to was Laguna del Sol. And it, it's really not that far. So that's that's where he went. So at this point, the FBI isn't looking at Kerry as the perpetrator. Are they only looking at him just to f- follow up more questions? Yeah, from what I understand is that they picked him up for questioning to help with maybe this case. I don't think they had in any way thought that he would just confess to it. So, yeah, as of right, this whole part of the story, it was for questioning. And that's only for the murder of Joey Armstrong. Right, because they have the right men behind bars for the other murders. Yeah, according to the to the local officials and, and FBI and the police, the right people are currently being held, and Carrie is only a, a, a suspect in this. Not, I don't even know if he was a suspect at this point. He was just being questioned. I mean, probably they all thought maybe suspect, but wording is it was questioning. But also with this confession during the questioning, he started, they were asking about Joey and he just kind of gave it up for all four murders. He just kept talking and it seemed like it was a, a back and forth of what are you actually talking about? And he didn't want to ruin the confession. So he kind of just slowly played it to get him to talk about it. So it's, again, he, the FBI go up there and, and take him into custody on the auspices that we have a sneaking suspicion he's probably the person who murdered Joey Armstrong. We're going to take him into questioning. And then, like you said, through this rapport that Agent Reinick was able to build with him, then Carrie just confesses to everything. Right. All the, all the murders, the, the Sun Peloso murders. Which we have said before, recommending the book. It goes into very much detail right. of the whole confession, but um, we're not going to get all into that. But yeah, it seemed like it was a very played out thing. It took a long time, but they finally got all of it. But during this, it seemed like Carrie was also asking for demands uh, to really fully confess. And like I said, it went on for a long time. But some of these, some of these um, demands were really quite out of there. The first one was that Carrie wanted to be placed in the new prison that was being built near Merced so his family could be close to him. That one seems it it could happen. You know, you you kind of hear some stories like this of people being closer to their families or That's not it on the surface that doesn't seem like such an unreasonable request. Right. The next which is really weird is that the reward money would go to Carrie's parents since he helped police figure it out who killed them. So this is the reward money that the the Sun Peloso families had got together for any information for the capture of the killer. Right. So he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm the killer. I turned myself in. I should get paid that reward money, but I want that paid to my parents. Right. That's a lot. That's a, yeah. It's but then the third, which is the most ridiculous, is that he wanted pictures and videos of underage children doing performing sex acts and just nude pictures. He just wanted a lot of child pornography and he brought it up a lot, which I mean, it's just ridiculous. So this is a part of the murders in this story that I think because of where we live, we've heard a lot about this over the years that I hadn't really thought too much about were the parts about of him raping Julie and Sylvina. And then, and in the book, when you find out that he's asking for specifically for these things, as well as we find out in the 2020 that we watched and in several articles that he had been kind of stalking and grooming his girlfriend's family. 
for certain things because he was sort of um, obsessed with her kids, that this redoing this case and listening to it really reminded me a lot of Parnell, the grooming, the manipulations. Carrie Stainer is different from Parnell in that he doesn't seem to prefer younger kids as Parnell does. Carrie Stainer seems more like an ebophile, which is someone who prefers children who are just post-puberty, so around 14 or 16. There's another category in between little kids and that. But again, these don't seem to be hard and fast rules based on everything I've been reading about that people often, I don't, I don't know what kind of specific kind of pornography he's asking for, what age group, but sometimes people who have a preference, they'll, they'll be all over the map. We talked about the doctor uh, back east in our last episodes who, who hurt boys and girls and kids of all ages. So even though Carrie Stainer in this case seems to prefer a certain age group, he can be... I guess, focused on other age groups as well. The other thing is that it's not always about a specific age, but often about a body type. So in this case, um, Joey Armstrong kind of fits into that. She looks a lot younger than she really is. Um, She's little. So Carrie Steiner is kind of, I think, more of an ephibophile. I haven't seen anything that has diagnosed him with that, and there are lots of issues around that paraphilia, but that's based on what I saw. Which would make sense considering that the women that he fixated on had that similar look. I mean, uh, Sovina and Julie and Joey all are, are young, younger looking either, if not in age, but in, in, like you said, body type, the, you know, the two young girls are just out of high school getting ready for, for college. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about these murders. Um, not just the murders, because I think that's what we hear most about, but the, the sexual acts, the rapes that he perpetrates or thinks about the fantasy part of it. And one of the things I really liked about Reinick's book is because a lot of the chapters are other crimes, but they focus a lot on sex crimes. And he talks at length about pedophiles and what he's seen during his um, time as an agent. And one of the things that I think he mentions in one of the chapters about people going to jail they start to worry about not having access to, like in this case, child pornography. And that comes out clear in Carrie Stainer's in his confession and asking to have that as... Yeah, just, uh, I mean... It's, I think, it's like any drug addiction, almost. Yeah. Right, and the idea that the police that arrested you, or in this case the FBI that's arrested you, is going to feed into that, almost to me shows uh, the addictive quality. Like, I'm, I'm not thinking in a rational way, I'm addicted to this. But then when, when you hear about his girlfriend and her family and the idea that he's been, it's almost like he's grooming them for a, being a potential victim. Yeah, because I think a lot of the cases we've covered, and that's true of the true crime community, I think we focus, I don't know how many times I said this during our last episodes, a lot on the things that make them kind of outrageous or different. And certainly the murders happening in a national park or happening the way that they happen makes them just hard to think about but the parts that are similar to what happened to so many people to being hurt by like we talked about with parnell pedophiles there's a lot about this that really is unfortunately happens to a lot of people the rapes it's too common to say that it's it's a one-off i can understand that that idea that oh oh my god i can't believe this happened well the sad fact is it happens more often than people i think are willing to admit the next thing I found really interesting was that Reinick told Carrie he would personally go to tell his parents about everything that Carrie did. So he arrived at their trailer the next morning. They had moved from the house on Betty and live in a trailer and informs Carrie, Kay and Delbert about what Carrie had done. When reading the book and after learning all about Stephen's story, I found it so crazy that when we started talking about Kay and Delbert, like a long time ago when we started the Steven Stainer episodes and now this and how polar opposites their stories are, but they are like the players that stay in these two different scenes because you have Kay and Delbert and how many times has law enforcement come to their house the first time when Steven went missing and then 
they had to deal with every time someone said they found a body and can't identify it, can you come identify when Stephen came back home as the hero, when Stephen died, and now this. It's like the same setting over and over again for the same two humans, and it's just such a long, huge period of time. I mean, from the first day that Stephen goes missing and then to now. It's it, many, many years. With not a lot, I mean... Yeah, the bright moment of Steven being returned, but then the hell that they have to be drugged through with the rehabilitation and, and like trying to build a family together. And now, and then Steven's death. And on top of which, oh, by the way, I have news about your other son who happens to be the, the serial killer that everyone's been looking for since February. It's a testament to them that they just didn't melt. I, 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 I can't believe. Like we've talked a lot about them in in your episodes, Jessica, and and how how strong these people are. But I think that to, if if nothing else, the resiliency of what a human can can stand is shown in these two people. So while Carrie sat in jail, assuming this is the same time Reinick was talking to uh, Carrie's parents, Ted Rollins. A local newspaper reporter went down to the jail where uh, Carrie was being held. I guess with the jail's permission, he let Ted conduct a 25-minute interview off camera. It it was pretty much a little summary of what he told Reinick, but Carrie tells uh, Ted that he did not sexually assault anyone. We come back to this when we go over the trial, but this whole thing to me, I feel like... He was really overstepping the boundaries. Everyone seemed to be, except Carrie. Uh, we talked a little about Stephen's story, how the media like jacked up Parnell's house and took those pictures and everything. But when we did mention that, we spoke how it wasn't a murder case, so maybe they weren't as cautious. But to me, this was this was a big screw up on like the jail and kind of just really bad moral and ethical judgment on this local newspaper reporter, Ted Rollins. Any thoughts, you guys? Yeah, I was kind of surprised that they let, that it, that he was able to get that in. You know, and I know, I know he talks about, like, pestering them all day, but even then. I think for me, I look at it a little different. I don't, I don't know what the danger here is exactly or if it affects the trial, but to me, this is what a reporter is supposed to do, supposed to bother them. And if there is some rule, I don't, is there a rule? I, I don't know. Against letting him talk with Carrie or talk with a, a person maybe in the first few hours or something since they've been arrested, then the people responsible for keeping him from doing that are the people who are guarding him. This to me seems, especially because we're talking about a case where two people who did not commit any crime are still in jail for murder. It seems to me that I think if we knew Carrie Stainer hadn't committed these murders, for instance, we'd feel differently about a reporter getting the chance to talk with him. Devil's advocate, it's in a way coercion. You have, to me, I'm just saying, you have a guy who gets there like at 7 a.m. and like every 30 minutes saying, hey, can you ask Carrie if he'll interview me? And the sheriff... And there, it wasn't just him. There was tons of other reporters. Mm-hmm. So you got this guy just saying, hey, would you do an interview? Hey, will you do an interview? Finally, at like 5 p.m., if you just keep asking someone, like bothering him, I mean, I, I don't feel like that's what reporting should be. I understand what you're saying. But I feel like if someone wants to talk, you don't just keep asking and asking. And I, I don't see that. My, my judgment, that shouldn't be what a reporter does. If it's the inmate saying, I don't want to talk, I think that's one thing. But when it's the people who are in charge of guarding that inmate, and I know in jails, it's up to the warden, whether they let news press come and talk to somebody. And that seems like a lot of power for a warden to have. People can't just get into a part of the jail. And we know things happen in jail that shouldn't. A warden decides if a newspaper person comes in where they look and where they don't look. And that just seems dangerous to me. So I understand that we know in this case, Carrie Steiner is guilty, but I don't think we should assume that all the time, especially when we're looking at it from the past. And it does seem to me that's part of what a reporter does. That is somebody... they don't take no from someone in a position of power. And that's what a guard is or what a warden is. 
So I wanted to throw in some quotes now like that you see in newspapers after the fact. And this quote is from July 26, 1999. It's someone who knew the Stainers growing up. It says, quote, I knew both of them. I played basketball with them, hung out with them. I think he's referring to uh, both Stephen and Carrie. He goes on to say, Carrie was pretty much a loner. He did his own thing. He smoked cigarettes. He stayed away from most of the other kids, end quote. I think this is an interesting description of Carrie because going over the Stephen Stainer stuff, a lot of people said this about Stephen too. So it's kind of like a, it's like a catch all for the Stainers that they were all loners in a way. It's just weird how they're two completely different people, but people say the exact same things about them. It's interesting because there are always quotes that don't have a lot of detail that are almost not worth quoting because right. I don't know if it's just the people who are willing to talk to the press or whatever, but there's really not much here. It's kind of, we hung out, but I actually don't really know this person. Right. I think a lot of times with big stories, like we've talked about how, you know, if something's talked about a lot, they, they want to throw it in. So it's like someone knew him. Let's just get whatever they say. When it makes out, it makes sense that both of those boys would kind of shy away from people. I mean, Stephen's constantly splashed in the news, so I don't want. I I would not want to be that. I, I'm I'm more apt to be alone, or I just want to you know be with close friends. And Carrie, I imagine anybody that comes up at that time and would want to hang out with Carrie, there a lot of the first thing would be, oh, you're Stephen Stainer's brother, right? So I can see people why, like you said, they would they would tend to either hang out with themselves or away from people or just very, very, very small group of friends. Another one of these great neighbor quotes, it says, quote, one time Cindy, who they're talking about Cindy Stainer, and I were outside at night and he exposed himself to us. He was perverted. I knew he was kind of weird, but I never knew he would get to the level of actually murdering anyone. Another one of those after the fact quotes. But it is, it does show, like we talked about before in the last episode, the idea that something that might have been laughed off at the time could actually be a warning sign that people maybe put off. He was doing something that might lead to doing something worse. Or how she said he was perverted, how we talked about a lot of people brush it off. This seemed to bother her, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But maybe giving the situation, not wanting to say anything more at the time or afraid to. So now having Carrie caught and confessed, uh, this seemed to open up a can of worms for things that are happening in the past. We spoke in last episode how they were looking back into Uncle Jesse's murder, wondering if Carrie did it. In an article I found in the Arizona Daily Sun, they said they were also looking into the murder of 34-year-old Denise Smith who was stabbed to death and then burned in a barrel close to Lake Don Pedro, where Julie was found. That murder has not been solved, and it seems like a really weird case to look more into for the future. Another one of these women, uh, named Sherilyn Murphy, was found murdered with no head or hands. In El Dorado County, authorities were revisiting a 1992 decapitation murder of 19-year-old Veronica Martinez. I think there was a couple more, but it just just having Carrie confess, I think there might have been a shred of hope that they could close these other cold cases. Here's a quote from a former FBI behavioralist, Clinton Van Zant, on why they were looking. Quote, it's not normal to wake up at the age of 37 and decide to kill three women. That's relatively old for a serial killer. What has this guy been doing for the last 10 or 15 years? There's a lot of work when a guy like this surfaces. So I think, you know, you've got all these unsolved murders. You've got a serial killer in the same area. Similar things. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to go back and look. What's interesting is we covered Sherilyn Murphy uh, in our last cold case last episode. And when I was doing the research for that, there were tons of articles that said police were going to look into it. And I don't know what happened with some of these others, but in a 2018 article the police had never even talked to him so i don't know if it was just discarded or if that was something the press was doing Mm. so just i was just kind of wonder what happened with all these others that are still unsolved on august 15th joey's funeral happened in sebastopol armstrong's ashes were buried sunday near a waterfall in a flower-lined garden at pleasant hill cemetery
From the earliest British settlements on the shores of Virginia, to the treacherous swamps of Louisiana and the isolated mountains of Appalachia, the American South has a rich history filled with eerie legends and mysterious hauntings. Join me, Brandon Schecksnyder, as I journey into its underbelly, exploring these tales of loss and heartbreak, tortured souls and spirits of the past, documenting ghost stories and legends amidst rich soundscapes and an eerie original soundtrack that can only be found on my podcast, Southern Gothic. So now we're going to go over the trials. Um, I tried to put a timeline together as best as possible. I'm going to start with July 28th, 2000, where I found the first stuff. So with this first trial of the murder of Joey Armstrong, the defense kept pushing it back because there was so much evidence to go over. Carrie pled not guilty, and in this article it talks about that there's over 16,000 pages of things like police reports and other evidence to sift through. And since Joey was murdered at Yosemite, it's considered a federal case, so all this is going on at Fresno at the time, same like place as the grand jury. They still had a lot to talk about before this case even goes to trial. This case was actually planned on being moved out of state. We had talked about this in previous episodes. That doesn't happen much, but they were talking about doing it here. Uh, One early thought was to go to Seattle. Another thing that was discussed was that the confession should be thrown out of court altogether. Another issue is whether the public should see the prosecution's document telling the government's argument for the death penalty. At the request of the defense attorneys who were worried that this could uh, prejudice potential jurors against Stainer, Judge Ishii in June sealed the documents, which detailed special circumstances of the murder. This became a huge issue over the next couple of months and goes to the Ninth Ninth District Court of California. A bunch of news affiliates sued, saying that this should become public record, which became United States versus Stainer. And on December 11th, 2000, it, the, eventually the news won and it was unsealed. So again, on the basis of freedom of the press, that's an information that the public should know. Right. On September 13th, Kerry d- decides to plead guilty to the murder of Joey to take the death penalty off the table. Now, this is only for the murder of Joey, since the trial of Carol Julian uh, Silvina is a completely different trial, which can still, the death penalty can still be on that, but this would take it off for this one. Right before sentencing at the trial of Joey, Carrie kind of blurted out an apology to the family and friends of Joey. While crying, he said, quote, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. I wish I could tell you why I did such a thing, but I don't even know myself. I'm so sorry. I wish there was a reason, but there isn't. It's senseless. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Afterwards, Joey's mother, Leslie, had this to say about the apology, quote, he sounded sincere. He's devastated. I'm devastated. We're all devastated. I ache for him. I ache for me. I ache for everything. I wish we could take it ba- all back and make it all different. That's amazing. It's pretty powerful. I don't know if I would have the same composure as she did in that situation. I don't know how you sit in a courtroom and listen to the man who brutally killed your daughter with an apology and then feel for that person. I think that takes a, a huge amount of empathy. After this trial is over, soon after, Carrie pleads not guilty to the killing of Carol, Julie, and Sylvina. So now preliminary hearings are going through. This is all the way up until June 14th, 2001. So it, it's been like a, six months since he pleaded not guilty, and they're just doing preliminary hearings now. And uh, it's looked over by Judge Thomas C. Hastings, who also presided over the Polly Class case. After these hearings, he said that Carrie needs to stand trial. He's charged with three murders and faces five special circumstances charges to seek the death penalty. These, mul- these are multiple murders, burglary, robbery, forced oral copulation, and attempted rape. In this article I read about, they said there was a total of 19 wit- witnesses over a two-day period. 
Jenny Horvath, the taxi driver, told her story. Jennifer Simmons, the front desk operator at the Cedar Lodge, said that someone changed Son's name to Smith on the hotel registry, but there was no explanation and they don't know who did it or why. They also played the confession tape for the first time here, and at one point, Sylvina's father leaped up and somewhat lunged at Stainer and yelled, son of a bitch. This isn't um, an outburst that I can understand. I think a lot of people can. I actually read an article about uh, the Poloso family. They had a, a really tough time after this murder for obvious reasons. Their daughter was murdered, and then shortly after, because they lived in Argentina, um, some stuff with the government and the and economy, they actually lose their entire business. And so for them even to be here in the United States for this trial, people give money. They fundraise to have them here. So they're going through a lot as well as being very sad and grieving. They lost their business in an unrelated way? Or was it because they were in the United States dealing with all no, of this tragedy? In an entirely unrelated way. It just all happened basically all at once. On July 16th, 2001, prosecutors announced that they will be seeking the death penalty. Now, on October 29th, the defense asked to change venues, saying there would be no way for a fair trial in Mariposa County. So almost three months, three months since the prosecution said that they'll seek the death penalty. And this is the next piece of info I could find. So it's everything seems to just be taking forever. The defense team wants to move to Los Angeles. But that idea was thrown out because court officials there said they would have problems finding room and providing staff for the trial in, a, in the city's busy courthouse. Here's a little stat that I thought was interesting. In Santa Clara County, 92% of those questioned knew about the killings. Of those, 69% said Stainer was probably or definitely guilty as opposed to 76% in Sacramento. So this is something they're doing to kind of see where they should move it to? Yeah, it's probably just, they probably did the polls. It could have been before just to see if he'd get a fair trial. It might be like the defense. And a not. piece of evidence saying, hey, if, if we move it, this, this is what we're going to walk into. Right. And it might not have been like uh, a random. They could have been asking people that might watch like Court TV or something because then they'd have a stronger opinion. And I think it's interesting because I think that's. I would almost put that statistic anywhere, not only in, in California, but anywhere where people were watching the news. Because this was a case that was highly televised. I mean, it was all over, I know, our local media in California, but a lot of the national news or agencies were carrying this as well. So it's another instance of I would have a hard time picking a place that you could go to and nobody heard about the case. Right. You know, And then it goes to the question of could you be impartial, but... But after much talk about this, uh, the case was actually moved to San Jose. On February 14th, 2002, even farther, the trial was pushed back more. Also around this time, the confession was allowed to stay in. The defense was trying to argue that the FBI should have stopped questioning him when he denied to talk and that he was coerced into a confession. The defense also brings up and says that he was pressured into talking to Ted Rollins and was not properly told he didn't have to talk to him. So that comes back to, because it might not have been that strong, but that whole thing that we talked about with, it could have messed up the trial. Yeah, it could have, it could have led to a killer's confession being completely thrown out. And it seems like from how Reinick deals with this part in his book that we talked a lot about it doesn't even see and again that's from his it, there's no coercion it's he talks to him it's not badgering him it seemed like almost carrie got it wanted to get it off his chest and come clean about it so even though him talking to ted rollins happens much later they're saying that affects his admission of guilt earlier it, he, was, it wasn't really much later. He was just still in jail right after confessing. Right, but like a few hours later. or he's already, It's not like at the same time he's No, confessing. he's already confessed. I he's already confessed. Well, that's what you're saying. He's already confessed to, to Reinick, and then a few hours later, Ted Rollins comes in. It could have been that both confessions are allowed. Maybe, oh, okay. they, were, maybe they were separated. I didn't see anything, but they, they were technically two confessions, so right. it could have been both. So on May 22nd, 2002, which is almost a year and a half after Kerry pleaded not guilty, he changed this to innocent 
by reason of insanity. The defense told the judge that Carrie suffered from OCD, depression, and an unspecified psychosis. This goes back to uh, our episode on the San Jose Halloween murders. Wasn't the using an insane defense really like a low, it never happens? Yeah, I think it was like less than 1% of the time. Yeah, so here's one of those cases. So now, trial finally starts July 15th, 2002. He pled not guilty in December of 2000. So it's, it's two and a half years since he's pled not guilty. I just, I find it interesting how long it takes just to get this going. And this is probably some, a quicker trial than some of the ones we've looked at. Right. On the fourth day of trial, the confession tape was played in the courtroom. I found this interesting. Prosecutors played three hours of the tape, but split it up, and then people have to listen to more confession another whole day. It's just it's drawn out, and that's a hard thing to listen to. Yeah, you have the murderer in graphic detail talking about their crimes. And the other, I'm pretty sure that the asking of those weird things are probably on there. Yeah, the, the, his need for child pornography and... yeah. On August 22nd, the jury started their deliberations as the prosecution had finished its closing statements. As part of the defense's case, jurors were shown Stainer's Rorschach test results. This is the psychological exam which requires a person to describe what they see in a series of ink blots. It revealed that Stainer had schizophrenic tendencies, according to the medical experts for his defense. The prosecution told jurors to disregard this test and called it, quote, loopy. He also says, quote, when you start using Rorschach to say this guy is goofy, it's like reading pig entrails. The idea that somehow he had this break with reality is just cuckoo, end quote. So I looked up Rorschach tests when I was uh, researching Steven Stainer because they actually give him a test a Rorschach test in that. We, ne- we didn't get to that. We didn't talk about it. Um, and I wasn't really sure that this test, I mean, I, I know what a Rorschach test is. It's the ink blots. We've probably all seen them. Someone shows them to you. And usually I've seen them when people are trying to determine parts of your personality, something like that. But I wasn't really sure it was scientifically sound. So when I looked it up, I found that it, it was, although it does not get used like they're saying here. You can't diagnose someone with schizophrenic Um, tendencies or issues with the Rorschach test. At least that's what they believe now based on my research. But it is interesting that it is something uh, a psychiatrist or someone can use. But but much like the stuff we've talked about, it needs to be someone who knows what they're doing. And often these things get picked up by other people who are using them for their own means. Yeah, I think part of that comes from the idea that Oftentimes, people see that Rorschach test as it's just random ink blots, but the test actually originated with a set group of pattern cards. So when you take a Rorschach test, it's the exact same cards that you see. So if the three of us here are taking a Rorschach test, we're seeing the same three cards or the same group of cards. And and experts, since this test was in, put in place, have collected statistical data on what types of people see what types of things in those cards. So that's a huge amount of data that you can go back. Like you said, not using it as, if you see this, you're going to do this, but more of a correlating data of people that have these tendencies seem to see these different things in these standard set cards. Yeah, it's not used to really diagnose a mental illness. It's more used to gain insight into people. But again, it needs to be done by someone who that's their specialty. And it's just not everybody's specialty. The other thing is that we've seen these so much in popular culture, and they are the original ink blots. They've always been the same, that that can also affect people when they're asked to look at them. You've probably already seen them if you haven't. There's even game. I think there's a game out. Mm-hmm. You can play with your friends with the ink blots. After taking a couple days, the jury of nine men and three women came back on August 26 and reached their verdict. Kerry was convicted of three first-degree murders with special circumstances. On September 18th, this is just a little, little weird side note, the death penalty phase was postponed because Kerry's lawyer, Marsha Morrissey, broke her foot. It was only a couple days recess, but... Thought I'd throw that in there. Um, While all this was going on, while they're waiting for the death penalty phase, there was 
the newspaper was, you know, still trying to write news and keep it in. And this was like a list of things that I found in the Nevada appeal.com of things that they've been talking about. Uh, one, Carrie had an above average IQ, but trouble recognizing emotion in other people. Like we've talked about before, he was obsessed with B- Bigfoot, but it also mentions that he was obsessed with Notre Dame. Since the age of four, he had a compulsion to pull out large chunks of his hair, and he also had a misshapen skull. He was reported sexually abused as a child by a relative, which we talked about. The kidnapping of his younger brother, Stephen, traumatized him at at a young age, and a malfunction of a portion of the brain that controls impulsive behaviors. I couldn't find what that was, but that's what it talked about. And all of this stuff was brought up at either at his trial or was circulating in the news. It seems like people are still searching for a reason why and are looking for, I won't say the oddest things, but to to blame his horrible crimes on his brother seems yeah, a couple, like, terrible. To blame his horrible crimes on Notre Dame almost. It's like, it's weird things to right, talk about. Right, the fact that he likes, or he, he's, he reportedly has seen Bigfoot is the reason why he went out and snapped rather than the fact that... He's a bad person that did terrible things to women. It's interesting, too, because when the book, In the Name of the Children, when uh, Agent Reineck is talking about uh, his experiences with Carrie Stainer, just in the car at first, and then later when he confesses to him, I think that's the first time I had seen Carrie Stainer presented in a different light. I hear a lot of people talking about how he's evil or he doesn't like hear recognize other people's emotions. But in their conversations, he seemed... I guess I just didn't expect him to be so normal is not the right word, but he was upset about the way his brother was treated. He has a lot of emotions and he seems like a, just not like a. He's not, he's not the, well, in this case, like what we said, he, he, he's not somebody that can't process emotion. He's not the soulless monster. I mean, he's a, he's a monster, but he's, he's one that has emotions that processes you know. Well, I hate the I'm, I hate to use the word psychopath because it's not it's not really a word for us to use or even used a lot anymore. But it plays into that idea that serial killers are always emotionless and right sociopathic. Right, and machines. he and, and and he's manipulative, so it's hard to know what's real or true. But he does present as someone who does care, especially about his family, and does seem to know that he's also doing something wrong. And it could be completely selective of what he what his emotions are. Yeah, he doesn't see the victims. We've talked about this before, too. He didn't see his victims as people. He talks about the idea that he didn't want he didn't want Julie to suffer, so he killed her, cut her throat, while the other two he'd already murdered. So it's this weird, like, I've abused this woman, I'm terrorizing, but I don't want her to suffer. I've already made her suffer. Not that disconnect, because she's not somebody that I, I'm... Or the uh, even the other two aren't people that I'm empathizing with. So around this time, I was reading this article how the defense used uh, Mike Eccles' videotape testimony about how he went and visited Carrie. This was used during the death penalty phase to hope to show jurors that the kidnapping really upset him and how he was just kind of forgotten about by his own family. So it says that Eccles said that Carrie lived at the house on Betty Street alone after the rest of the family moved out. There was this weird, really weird thing in the article about a dinner schedule when everyone still lived there. I guess back in the day when everyone lived in the house on Betty Street, Kay's parents, who were also divorced, lived there also. The article says, At supper time, a bell would ring and Kay Stainer's father would come out of his room and eat alone. When he was done, a second bell would ring, and his blind ex-wife would arrive for her meal. After she finished, a third bell signaled chow time for the rest of the family. That seems like a very odd living situation. Although if, you're, if, you're, if I'm having to deal with divorced parents living in my house together, a bell system to say it's okay, especially if the parents didn't get along with each other, just to keep the peace. You can have the dinner table here. Then, you know, mom's going to come out and eat dinner. And then the rest of us are going to come out later. It's in a little odd, but I can I can see that a family that's trying to make things work and keep peace in the house, why that would might be 
And it's a pretty small house, the one on Betty Street. So that's a lot of people right. to manage. But just thinking about what if they wanted, the kids wanted like a friend over and then the that kid goes home and goes, yeah, they rang a bunch of bells and everyone would come out and eat at a different time. It's a weird situation. You're, no, you're right. But I also think for me, this this is because Mike Uckles, we've talked about him a lot, though, that idea of like, because he's written about Stephen. Now he's writing about Carrie and it's almost that he's using the story that to an outsider is a little odd, but how many things, if you were to look at people's inside people's homes might be looked at odd as outsiders, but, but that's how those fan, that's how the Stainers survived with a, with a large family in a small home where you have, I mean, I think it's interesting that, that the divorced parents are still living in the exact same house with the kids. That's odd, but that's how they made it work. Especially if I'm assuming this is the death penalty part, right? So Mike Eccles is testifying in order to let the judge know or the and the court know that Carrie Steiner's life hasn't been perfect as a defense, basically. Right. For, I think that's what it was. So for me, this is kind of a, I don't know, it's a strange story, but it doesn't really suggest to me that he wouldn't be responsible for his actions. I think, yes, but I think what that's what the, it might be like a long shot. They're just trying to. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And it also poor, this poor family constantly just being drugged through. I felt bad for that is it's another instance of them pointing the fingers at the Stainer family and saying the reason why can't Carrie killed these four people is not Carrie's fault. It's his, it's his family's fault. Right. It's again, it's Steven getting blamed for something that had nothing to do with it's his, it's his parents, his poor parents who have, went through hell for years and is go are going through it again and they're getting the finger pointed at them because their son chose to do something terrible and of course they're not a perfect family no no, no family is but by any stretch yeah i'm not trying to to I say think. that they're that there's n- no correlation or there's right i just think this one sounds kind of like a stretch but i can see why it plays well but you like and like you said, John, it is an odd story, right? It's that a, was a, it, it's a weird reading it. I just thought I would like to share it because there's just weird bell ringing and weird eating. So, but his testimony in in this trial, that's where they get a lot of the ideas about what Carrie's life was. If I remember, yeah, yeah, and he it's taped because during the trial he was out of country on vacation, so he couldn't actually do it in person. Around the same time during the death penalty phase, I found an article in the Berkeley Daily Planet, and it was talking about how the the Stainer family was there to hope to persuade the jury not to give Carrie the death penalty. This is a very interesting quote. Kay Stainer said, quote, If his dying would bring these people back that he killed, I say do it, but executing Carrie is not going to bring them back, end quote. Her saying kill him it's just i mean i i know what she's saying but it was just strong to say it that way as a mother i i she, i would imagine she's sympathizing a lot with the parents and having having one of her sons already die yeah but while people talked they had um enlarged pictures of carrie when he was a kid delbert went on the stand and said he was a bad father at times uh, he was recovering from back surgery when carrie was born and avoided picking him up and if little infant carrie was would cry delbert would yell at him to stop which just scared him more because he's just an infant also in this article it talks about how the stainers didn't attend the trial because carrie asked them not to and Kay also had a job and couldn't leave that much because of her job on december 12th 2002 carrie stainer was sentenced to death The judge in this case, Thomas C. Hastings, even left for several minutes because it was too much for him. The defense also asked for a new trial because of jury misconduct. I guess there was a question on the questionnaire that, you know, they hand out to jurors before when picking that asked if they've ever been molested as children, and three of the jurors left that blank. Then the defense said that the same three jurors that left it blank talked about the abuse during deliberations. The judge did not honor this because he said Carrie still got a a fair trial with how much overwhelming evidence was involved. Though Carol's father, Francis Carrington, did not feel any sympathy for Carrie whatsoever, I found it interesting what he said about Kay and Delbert. Quote, I feel very sorry for Stainer's mother and father. They've had a rough time of it. I wish them the best. 
Also, after the hearing, the Stainers apologized to the victim's family and shook their hands. Um, we have discussed things like this before, and I, I just, for me personally, shaking of hands after this all goes on with just the parents. I find that, I, I know there's no right way to do anything in mm-hmm. this kind of situation, but that is such a odd gesture that I, do, I don't know how to take in, just shaking hands with each other. I don't know what to say about it. I just felt it was a very interesting gesture. In one in one way, it seems so impersonal, like a shake hand, you know, like you do, you do that with strangers. Right. You know, but I think I can see it being, uh, I want to express some empathy or, or I'm apologizing and I, I don't, a hug just seems. That's too much. Yeah. And, but, I, but that, just that simple physical contact of a handshake can at least lend some of that. Well, and the, it's a good way to do it because I think the person can choose not to. If you go in for a hug and the person's not ready for you to be in their right. physical space or and you don't know how this is going to come, you know, they could yell at you. You have no idea what you're gonna, what's going to happen when you go over to apologize and, and sympathize with this family. I think to me, this is a good middle ground. You're respecting their space, mm-hmm. but you're, you're being able to say what you need to say. Right. And I, I understand that. It just seems like the situation must be the that's must be one of the hardest things. I, I couldn't, that would be so hard for me because to initiate it or accept it. It's, that would be so hard. Especially after the victim's families have heard what they've heard, you know, and the murderer's family, you know, what the stainers have went through. Yeah, there's nothing to say about yeah, that. It's, it's hard. Just, it's just hard to think about. Mm. Carrie Stainer is still on death row at San Quentin with many other that we've talked about in different episodes. Um, with Del- Delbert and Kay Stainer, Delbert passed away in 2013 at the age of 79 and was buried in Atwater, which is right next to Merced. And Kay is still alive somewhere. And Joey Armstrong, who was a Nature Bridge outdoor educator, the Nature Bridge organization has started uh, an Armstrong scholarship program that takes young women out and leads them on a 12-day outdoor excursion to help build leadership and empower young women um, with an eye towards environmental sciences. Uh, We're also going to post the links to where, if you're interested in donating to this organization, we'll be posting that at CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Carol Sund, uh, now there was a foundation set up under her name, the Carol Sund Carrington Foundation. Uh, From GuideStar.org, the mission statement says, The Carol Sund Carrington Memorial Reward Foundation has been established to provide resources to families to offer reward for information to help law enforcement officials locate missing and loved ones and bring violent criminals to justice. Additionally, the foundation is determined to raise public awareness surrounding the problem of missing persons and violent crime in this country. And this foundation, um, after this, does a lot of good. There's some pretty big cases. In Modesto, like the the Lacey Peterson case that they kind of get involved in and help the families with. Uh, And when I was researching the foundation, one of the things that came up, one of our early cold cases, I think we did it during the Stephen Stainer series, was a girl named Vanessa Dawn Smith who had gone missing in Merced, and they still don't know where she is. That family actually contacts Jody Stainer, Stephen Stainer's wife, and asks her to contact the Carrington Foundation to get help. And they, they do all that, and they actually put up a reward, which I found that connection interesting. Um, but it's then shut, shut down in, during the global financial crisis. The Carringtons lost some of their... They they were in the business of running shopping centers all over California, I believe, and they lost some of their business. And so, and they were basically funding the whole foundation. So, it's unfortunately shut down, but it did a lot of good things while it was up and running. But it shows the importance of an organization like that to help get the word out Absolutely. and help organize volunteers and community action. We've seen that a lot in a lot of the cases we had, where the difference between getting more information out there can be the difference between getting getting a case solved. So, And one of the big things they did was help with the press, which is a hugely important. We now know from all of our episodes. Keep, keep that in 
the people's forefront, keep yeah, people letting, talking about it. Well, yeah, but also letting family know what's going to happen, what to expect when the press comes into town, kind of dealing with them on their behalf is a really great thing for a lot of families. There were three different memorials uh, for the trio of girls. On April 10th, 1999, the family gathered to pay respects for Carol and Julie. On Saturday, the family held a private memorial service at St. Bernard's Catholic Cemetery. The next day was more of the big public memorial, and um, at least 1,000 people showed up, including Senator Dianne Feinstein, and this was at the Sacred Heart Church in Eureka. And then on Monday, another public service was in Modesto at the gathering point uh, for like where investigators and relatives since were all gathering around. And this was at the Doubletree Hotel. After Sylvina Peloso's body is released from the Mariposa County Sheriff's, um, it's actually taken back to Argentina and it's done so on a private plane from someone in Stockton. Carol Carrington, Carol's mother, travels with the body back to Argentina because she doesn't want it to go alone. Um, and when she gets there, she's met by Sylvina's family, and they walk together through the streets. And there's just this really nice portion where Sylvina's mother actually is walking through the streets and having a difficult time. And she's carried by her mom on one side and Carol on the other, and she calls them her two moms. So it's just this family kind of coming together that already knows each other, sort of, but in, in tragedy, really. Right. You can see how, how much this case, it crosses continents it, it losing these four people affected so many people and you don't just look on the victim side you look on carrie's family and everyone else it it's just such a huge pot of people that are brought together in a, this horrible tragedy and we we try really hard i think since we've been doing this podcast but all the time when we talk about these cases to really highlight the fact that so oftentimes it's Carrie's name that's in the news it's people are looking at that but there's so much more to this because of the four women that were, that were victims of these terrible crimes and then like you said those ripples go out beyond that and I think that's this is one case of that I think that's true of every time right we talk about a case or you see something in the news, and I think it's important that people stop and realize that, that for every 30-second news bite of a terrible crime that people are listening to or reading or watching, that, that's, that that sends ripples out through families and communities that can have lasting effects years beyond the terrible, terrible tragedy. I think it reminds me all of our cases have had a huge effect on communities, and it just reminds me of one of the things that happened in Sonora, which is near to where... Julie's body is found and the surrounding areas, they get together to plant flowers where her on this hill, this pretty steep hill where her body was found because they want the world to know that there's goodness in these areas, that this bad thing isn't the only thing. We're going to end there with this. We'd like to thank everyone. Uh, it was technically 15 episodes. If you go back to Stephen, we've been talking about the stainers for a while. This is technically our last case we'll be dealing with in season one. Um, may kind of, you'll see, but we'll, uh, we'll still have some stuff while we get prepared for season two. I'd like to thank you, Charles and Jessica for this tonight. And I'm pretty sure Charles is reading us our cold case tonight. The information for this episode's cold case comes from ABC 10 and articles in the press tribune. On January 30th, 1992, the family of Veronica Martinez filed a missing persons report in Cool, California, a small town 40 miles outside of Sacramento. Veronica Martinez was 19 years old and was last seen on January 27, 1992, when her friend drove her to a pack-and-save on Florin Road in Sacramento, California. Veronica was at the pack-and-save to grocery shop and told her friend that her brother would pick her up when she was done. Veronica Martinez was pregnant and a mother of a 2-year-old and a 4-year-old in 1992. When she was last seen, she was wearing a white sweater and red pants. She is described as being Hispanic descent, 5 feet 4 inches tall, and 130 pounds. She did not have her children with her when she disappeared. On March 7, 1992, a little over a month after Veronica disappeared, a man described as a bottle collector 
looking for bottles off the side of Highway 49 between Auburn and Placerville in El Dorado County, found Veronica Martinez's body. Her body was near a place described as Cool Cave and at the bottom of a steep ravine in heavy brush. She was nude except for a bra and had been decapitated. Her body was wrapped in plastic. Police believe that Veronica Martinez may have been alive and held for a period of time before her body was found. Her body had been badly decomposed, but her autopsy showed that she'd been deceased for 7 to 10 days and did not believe that she had been sexually assaulted. Police also do not know Veronica Martinez's cause of death. Unlike many of the victims in our episodes, we could find very little about Veronica Martinez, including a picture. What we do know is that she was expecting a child and a mother of two others. She was a waitress who lived in Sacramento and worked very hard to provide for her family. She and her loved ones deserve answers and justice. If you have any information about the murder of Veronica, please call the El Dorado County Cold Case Task Force at the phone number of 530-621-4590 or email at coldcasetaskforce at ecdgov.com. U.S. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of California True Crime. If you have any questions or comments, you can find us at Cali True Crime on Instagram or Twitter. We're also on Facebook, and you can email us at California True Crime at gmail.com. We'd also really appreciate a review if you're so inclined. Special thanks to our amazing advisor, Melanie Duncan. This is a production of Chateau Walnut.